everyone, this is Ari, and I have a very special announcement to make before we get into today's podcast episode. Right now, during April 2019, for the next few days only from April 4th through April 15th, we're releasing our Energy Blueprint Masterclass training series that's designed to help you beat fatigue and dramatically increase your energy levels. This masterclass training is normally $197, but right now, just for the next few days until April 15th, you can get access to this 100% free as my gift to you. In this masterclass training, I'm gonna show you the exact six step blueprint for overcoming fatigue and getting your energy back and how to literally rewire your body to produce more energy at the cellular level. Now, if you've already seen our masterclass videos previously, then I have good news because I just completely redid all four of those masterclass videos just in the last few months with brand new content, including research that has just come out in the last year. And I've packed them with literally more than double the content and strategies that the previous videos have. Trust me, this is absolutely must-see material for everybody who cares about their health and certainly everyone looking to overcome chronic fatigue or chronic low energy levels or people who are already pretty healthy and just want to take their energy to new heights. To get access to these masterclass videos, just go to theenergyblueprint.com forward slash masterclass, all one word, masterclass theenergyblueprint.com forward slash masterclass. Once you sign up there, you're going to get four power packed masterclass videos. And right now, just until April 15th, this is all 100% free. Now I promise even if you've been studying health for years or decades and you think you know it all and you've heard it all and read it all and seen it all, you're going to be blown away by the material that I'm sharing here. It's packed with powerful techniques that you've never heard of before and some really critical must-know information for everybody dealing with chronic fatigue or low energy levels. So just, again, go to theenergyblueprint.com forward slash masterclass. You can get access right now, 100% free. Uh, and again, this is all shutting down on April 15th. So mark these dates down on your calendar. Masterclass one comes out on April 4th. So by the time you're listening to this, Masterclass one will have already been released. That's Thursday, April 4th. And then Masterclass 2 comes out on Monday, April 8th. The third Masterclass on April 11th and the fourth on April 15th. So go take action on this right now. Just go to theenergyblueprint.com forward slash Masterclass and you can get access right now. Okay, now let's get into today's podcast episode. Hey guys, this is Ari Witten, and welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. As you can see, if you're watching this video, this is a unique episode. We're actually in my house, and this is my personal dentist. And uh, she's been on the podcast before. Her name's Dr. Nicole Vane. She is an expert in holistic and integrative dentistry. And she's been texting me recently, and she's like, hey, you got to have me back on your show because I have all this cool new stuff that I want to talk about. So here you see all this all these notes that she's bombarding me with about all these, you know, all these books and things that she's like highlighting and excited to show me. So um, we're going to be sharing with you a bunch of great new information uh, related to dental health, but more broadly to all aspects of your health and to fatigue and, and some unique uh, causes of fatigue that not a lot of people are talking about. So welcome back, Dr. Nicole Bain. Thank you for having me back. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a pleasure. So um, first of all, let's talk about what holistic and integrative dentistry means. So wh what's the difference between a, a regular dentist and somebody who's like you specializing in holistic and integrative dentistry? Well, um, that's a great question because it took me a long time to figure it out myself, but it's understanding the relationship between each tooth and the body. So each tooth is on a meridian and each tooth links to different organ structures in the body. So if a tooth is mistreated, it can cause a trigger of misinformation in terms of energy flow to organ systems, which can manifest in many different ways. So it's not something we're ever taught about in dental school, but it's very similar to the way acupuncture works in that you can get a needle in your hand that's actually going to help the liver work better mm -hmm. or a chiropractor who makes an adjustment in your neck or spine to get the energy to flow better to your kidney it actually has the same messenger system within our body related to the teeth. And the second part of it is that we're trained, I mean, I've been practicing over 15 years, but 
even now in dental school, we still learn mercury fillings, gold crowns. Mm -hmm. the, the standard is 30 years ago. And a lot of those materials we found to be toxic. And a lot of the new sexy, beautiful white materials we use are fancy plastics. And much of them have, or many of them have BPA in them and different mm -hmm. resin cascades that are also super toxic. So we're training mercury for another one that can cause a lot of problems in patients. Mm -hmm. So um, especially patients that are already autoimmune, they are very sensitive and can't clear or don't know what to do with these foreign materials. And so their body starts reacting and there's no dentist out there who, who would tell them it's their tooth causing it because we're not trained on it. So we have a lot of separate academies um, we're our own people, so to speak, uh, the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, International Academy of Biologic Medicine, there's a holistic dental association where we meet a lot on how to get people to detox some of these toxic materials out of their body or how these patients present and how we can make them better. Gotcha. So it's, it's pretty, pretty complex. Yeah, excellent. And, you know, the, the, the integrative part, I just want to emphasize that a, a little bit more, which is kind of that you're looking, you, you know, a lot of what you're doing is procedures on the mouth, but it is with this understanding of how that is relating to so many other aspects of health. Right. And, and we have research linking what's going on in the mouth to obviously things like heart disease, neurological diseases. Um, what else? you know, leaky gut and a variety of other Right, things. right. Like the big thing that's really hit in the past 10 years is the relationship between getting your teeth cleaned and getting heart disease, like you said, or, or triggers for heart attacks. There's a lot of C-reactive proteins and different bugs that come from our mouth that we know now go throughout our body. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to get your hip replaced or you're going to undergo major surgery, they want dental clearance because there's a lot of bacteria that goes from our mouth throughout the body. So mm -hmm. That there is that understanding and holistically then it's knowing it at a greater level of how to address it. It's more than just scraping teeth. There's a lot of things to look for on 3D x-rays. We look at the airway and um, you and I in a side conversation earlier, I was telling you how we can often see gut dysbiosis and different issues in the GI by seeing how inflamed the mouth is mm -hmm. because the gut is the second brain, right, of our immune system but so is the mouth. Everything in the mouth literally mirrors the gut. So even though I can't see down their throat into their intestine, I can tell by the type of bacteria in their mouth and how their, their tissues are responding, what the bleeding's from. It's not just as simple as not flossing. It can yeah. really be like a core inflammation that's manifesting in the mouth. Yeah. The other thing we're really seeing a lot of that's intrigued me, and one of the reasons I'm like, you have to have me back, <laughs> is the acidity I'm seeing in the mouth and the amount of grinding and things that we would attribute just in dentistry to stress or you having a wrong bite. It's actually acidity from your GI that's manifesting in the mouth. Mm. Some of the excessive erosion and things a, do a dentist will just say, you're brushing too hard or you're grinding your teeth and it's actually a core issue coming from gut issues or autoimmune issues. Mm. So you can't solve one without solving the other. Yeah. And these pieces of the puzzle are just so fascinating to me. Yeah. And then the more you learn about it, the more cases you see and the more questions you start asking and it, patient interviews get more detailed, but it's really interesting to see them unraveled. Some of them take a while, but to see patients get better mm -hmm. has been like, phenomenal yeah so so i want to jump right into this topic that you've been super excited about yeah. which is airways that's you have this book sitting over here on the table called gasp yeah so what what have you been researching and and i know it's not just that you just read a book and right right you've right, actually yeah. been applying this with patients yeah. for for a while now and your findings have been i think quite shocking to not only your patients but you as well so Talk to me about what you've what you've discovered when it comes to airways. Well, um, it it kind of started actually with my own mouth. That uh, as a dentist who wanted to be a dentist because of the way my orthodontics were done, mm -hmm. when I became a dentist, I'm like, wow, the orthodontist that I loved so much that inspired me totally messed up my bite, my health. There's so many things that were because they pulled several teeth when I was growing and shoved my arches back, it's led me with a lot of issues that I can't fix anymore because I'm no longer growing. So TMJ, headaches, postural issues, I have to go to the chiropractor, 
to compensate for the way my bite is, mm -hmm. from the way my braces were done. So all these pieces of the puzzle that I saw on myself have made me very intrigued. Mm -hmm. And as you dive into it more, you start learning more about how tongue ties develop and why the arches are constricted and it all relates to diet. Mm -hmm. So when you start learning more about the diet and how our modern day Western diet and the nutritional deficiencies that have developed from having these softer foods and highly processed foods, how it's misshapen our jaws, which then leads to no room for our tongue, which leads to breathing issues and sleep disordered breathing, which then makes our body more acidic and triggers more autoimmune. So all these pieces coming in are just fascinating to me. And so I've been diving in a lot more into um, what we would typically think of as sleep apnea, but it's actually it's actually not just that. It's sleep disordered breathing and different forms and ways that I'm seeing it manifest in the mouth. Mm. So I, I want to jump back just a little bit to something you yeah. were saying uh, uh, 30 seconds ago, which is just the fact that there, there are all of these sort of weird abnormalities mm -hmm. occurring in our mouths and on our jaw structure. And, uh, you know, I think there are sort of two ways of looking at that or two mm -hmm. theories that you could have when it comes to just the, the, the reason that we have so much of those issues. Like why do people need braces and retainers and so much work, right. structural work on their mouths? Why are humans being born with those issues? And you could say, I guess, one theory could be, hey, that's just how we're supposed to be. And, um, you know, we just have a sense of aesthetics where, you know, we want to, to fix all those things to make them look a certain way, but really everything is as it should be from an evolutionary perspective. And then the other way of looking at it uh, would be, you know, I think to, to go look at some of these tribes and traditional peoples right. who are existing in a more historically sort of native and traditional way that humans have existed for most of evolution and see if they also have the same dental issues that we have. And then from there, you can kind of get more clarity on that. I know, I know we're going to get more into that, but yeah. it's basically it's the latter, right? It's, it's that we're, we're in the modern world, we have all kinds of abnormalities in the jaw structure and the way the teeth come in that then we require dental work to fix those things. Right, right. So the, the Price Podner studies, like Dr. Price, Weston Price in the 1920s was traveling around looking at all these schools and schools of just a hundred years before and also schools of the initial homo sapiens with these broad wide arches and wide open airways by the way um, our ability to speak dropped our voice box and made us let the ability of homo erectus to be upright actually what initially led to the constriction of our airway also but um having these diets where we're eating meat off the bone eating raw crunchy carrots not having these soft cooked foods, um, and then the advent of the industrialized wheat, all the wheat products and processed flours and hot dogs and all these other things. If you go to a tribe, and back then in the 1920s, he went to several tribes that were literally like loincloths, not touched by society, and there's wide, broad arches, broad open airways, broad open nasal passages, and no decay. Mm. So you're finding these skulls, and they can date them. People were still living to their 60s, 80s, with no decay and all the wisdom teeth in them and one generation of them being touched by a Western diet and they had decay cavities and gum disease wow. in their children. So it's amazing. It would manifest that. So just to play devil's advocate, um, if somebody didn't want to be, you know, a believer in the idea that we're having all these abnormalities in our jaw structure and our, the way our teeth are coming in as a result of, you know, just, one generation or a few generations of the modern Western diet. Are there any other layers of evidence to support this? Like have they done experiments in animals showing that, you know, you can, you can take some kind of animal subjected to a different kind of diet and then all of a sudden see totally different jaw structures and, and the way the teeth are coming in? Well, one of the most common ones referenced is Pottinger's cats, right? So Pottinger had cats and he had this theory um, that food was affecting the, the way arches are developing and so he took the cats and had one control study of cats that were given the regular they all nursed um, and were breastfed and then given raw meats and then he took 
another set of kittens from the same litter and gave them pasteurized milk and cooked, processed, canned, soft food. Wow. And all of those kittens developed with narrow arches, narrow airways, and crowded teeth that were given the pasteurized milk in one generation. And their kittens of that same control, not the control group that was breastfed, but the control group that was fed what would be related to our modern day diet. All their kittens had of the next generation, more crowded teeth and more, and then the next generation after that, even worse. Yeah. Wow. So it's amazing how one shift can lead to three generations of like now what's would take, I don't even know evolutionarily how you start to undo that. Yeah. Um, and what we're seeing is such bad crowding that not only is there not room for the wisdom teeth, but now Traditionally, what happened in my case as well is we take out several adult teeth and shove the teeth even further back because there's no room for them, mm -hmm. which further narrows our airway, leaves no room for our tongue, leaves us with odd facial profiles, and also causes a lot of breathing issues, no room for our adenoids. So that's what's leading to a lot of the increases in children with tongue tie and with ADHD. Um, it's up 700% since 1970. Wow. And a lot of that's related to breathing issues. Mm -hmm. Kids, uh, and our facial aesthetics too have changed. Even since Robert Redford and Marilyn Monroe were referenced as the beauties of like the 1950s, they have wide, broad jaw forms mm -hmm. and no orthodontics, mm -hmm. broad nasal passages. And then our modern day beauties of Justin Bieber, who has a long face a pointy little pug nose, and he mouth breathes. Whoa, it's, Why I know, so I know, I Justin know. Justin Bieber, that's messed up. I'm not a believer. <laughs> I think he, he's talented in his own way, but he's an example of our modern day beauty is really shifting to the narrow face structure also because it's becoming such the norm. I don't even want to know what it's going to look like in two generations from now. Um, what the version of beauty is going to be in terms of our facial jaw structure. It's truly being so deformed. Even if you look at in the 1940s, the, the shifts from 1900 to 1940, you started to see what's developing instead of what's called a U-shaped arch, which is essentially the shape of the tongue mm -hmm. with a wide vault. You're seeing these narrow V-shaped arches with sharp nasal passages mm -hmm. in by the 40s. So now obviously with more modernized food, the applesauce pouches and the chicken McNuggets and the mac and cheese, kids are not only having food allergies related to the way they were processing our foods, but they're also not having room for their tongues and we're ending up with all of these tongue ties and the trend away from breastfeeding in the 1960s as women came into the workforce that really also exacerbated the way the arches were being developed. Mm. So it's it's pretty fascinating to see how in a small time frame how much we've changed our facial profiles. And it's not just in the USA. You know, if you went to China and they introduced a McDonald's, they too start having extreme obesity, crowding, gum disease, and in just one generation. Yeah. It's really interesting. So we're in the McDonald's Justin Bieber era now. We are. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> it's going to be great. Um, so what, what I'm seeing a lot, and the reason I, I reached out to you, is these people, well, there's a great book by Dr. Felix Leal called Six Foot Tiger, Three Foot Cage. And he makes the analogy, it's like putting a six-foot tiger in a three-foot cage that we've narrowed the arches so much the tongue has nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. So what we attribute now to not sleeping well because of stress and we're, we're, everyone's on the go and they're drinking coffee and whatever, it's actually that we're not getting good REM sleep. We're, a lot of times we're either stuck in stage three or not even entering stage three sleep. So there's no restorative sleep. So we're seeing this huge, huge surge in autoimmune disorders which is diet plus how, how well we're getting oxygenated and nourished. Our bodies are just, they don't know what to do with all these modern day insults. Yeah. So I want to, I want to get back to the autoimmune stuff yeah. later and maybe even more specifics on the nutrient stuff. Um, but let's, so we have, you know, kind of the, the modern lifestyle, the modern yeah. diet is affecting jaw structure, dental structure, going back to airways. What's, what's going on there? 
Okay, so so what we're seeing um, as these children are being, they're either tongue-tied and not diagnosed or they're bottle-fed in general for the convenience of the mother. It's not to, to shame anyone for bottle feeding. It's just to let people know that the lack of nursing is leading to automatically the nasal passage the nasal passage is developing very narrow and the tongue isn't being brought up to the roof of the mouth to shape it to have enough room for the teeth. So already when the primary teeth are coming in, there's not enough room for the tongue. So what happens is the tongue over time either starts to fall back and block the throat or the children will shift to getting really large adenoids. So instead of breathing through a pretty broad area, you're breathing through instead a little teeny drinking straw at night. And so, j just tell people what adenoids are. For so adenoids are, are your tonsils. Okay. So having enlarged tonsils in the back of your throat, having kids sleep with their mouth open, um, getting what we call um, allergic shiners, which is having um, big baggy eyes in children is a sign that they're not getting enough air. They're not able to breathe through their nose properly. So if their mouth breathing a lot, it leads to a lot of inflammation in their throat, tonsils, airway, and a lot of it will manifest as a lack of oxygen. In children, it shows up as ADHD. They're struggling to stay awake mm -hmm. because they're not sleeping restfully at night. Even if their eyes are closed and it looks like they're sleeping, they're constantly lethargic. And then what we see in adults is we see them, people who, who are falling asleep at stoplights, falling asleep at their desk, they're having 20 cups of coffee to get through the day, mm -hmm. they're having brain fog, they can't focus, they're not performing well at work, they have no motivation to work out because they're so tired all the time, and they don't know why. So there, there is that subset of population where you know everyone's on there playing video games at night and comes home and gets fast food and sits on the couch. So those people, obviously, we would expect it. But there's also people who are trying their hardest to stay healthy, eat right, work out, and they can't lose weight. Right. And they don't know what's wrong. They don't feel like themselves anymore. And we're seeing it in younger and younger subsets. Like what we would think of as sleep disordered breathing or sleep apnea is a big fat 60 year old who snores like a freight train at night. And that's what medical doctors think of. That's what primary care physicians typically would, that you wouldn't even fall into that category if you went to your doctor and said, what is wrong with me? I can't lose weight. I'm working out or I can't work out. I can't get motivated. Then they'll even put you a lot of times on antidepressants and then you'll start manifesting more with the lack of oxygen with all these other autoimmune things, thyroid, whatnot. So then you're like, oh, I must be so tired because of my thyroid. And the whole issue is you're not getting restful sleep because you can't get enough oxygen saturation at night to reach REM sleep. Yeah. So starting at birth with the bottle feeding and you know, Hey, my son on, on his, after he goes to his playgroup, he'll have an applesauce pouch. It may be organic, but he's still not chewing the apple, mm -hmm. right? So he has crowded teeth, and it drives me crazy. He's a two-year-old. I breastfed him, <laughs> but he's already headed on that path because he was tongue-tied, and he has my genetics now for yeah. a narrow arch and facial form. So um, some people are good compensators to a point. Like, you know, I, I got through college and dental school on five hours sleep a night with no coffee. I, I am not that person now. <laughs> I don't know how, but I'm a, I'm a good compensator. So now I have thyroid disease and all these other issues, and I'm a good compensator, but essentially, if I'm not aware of it and, and doing everything I can to prevent it, I'm headed for a huge crash myself. Mm -hmm. And you see it in so many of my patients that are on disability now, they can't work, they're told they're depressed, they don't know even where to start, and even if they went to a medical professional, the medical professional doesn't know where to start either. Mm. Um, so I, I'm seeing all the relationship in the mouth. And mm. so what happens is, is people who had orthodontics, I mean, it's kind of a rite of passage nowadays, right? Yeah. Everyone has it in junior high. I know I couldn't wait to get my braces because everyone had them. <laughs> But they took out four teeth on me. And most people have eight teeth taken out. They're with some teeth plus their bicuspids. And evolutionarily, some people, including actually in my family, it's a, it's a trait, are missing their lateral incisors or initial teeth on top of that because there's just no room genetically for everything. Wow. So now we have this tongue and this airway that should be wide. And it's we're narrowing it with our orthodontics. We're shoving everything back in the face. Mm -hmm. So you might be fine as a teenager, but when you're entering now your 20s, 
in the workforce. And then again, if you're not eating well on top of it, you're going to end up with very, very unrestful sleep. So what happens is you end up with something that's not truly sleep apnea, but it's called OSD, which is obstructive sleep disorder or OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, or SDB, which is sleep disordered breathing. Mm -hmm. So if you did a sleep study at night, you would not be categorized as having true apnea, which is a certain amount of stopped breathing for a certain amount of time. So let's just say there's 60 episodes in an hour where you stop breathing for 10 seconds each time. You wouldn't classify as true sleep apnea because the cutoff might be 20 seconds of stopping breathing to be diagnosed. And, and the way that they... The way that they do that is not is like basically with hard cutoffs. Like you have to meet these criteria yes. to be diagnosed with sleep apnea, but they don't frame it as a spectrum of like you're halfway in the direction yes. of sleep mm -hmm. apnea. You know, at the optimal breathing pattern is over here, let's say, and then you know, sleep apnea is over here, and you're about like here. Right. So if you were breathing, let's just let's call the cutoff 15 seconds. So if you stop breathing for 11 seconds, you're not going to be classified as having sleep apnea, but you do have obstructive sleep apnea. So you might not need a CPAP, CPAP machine, which is forced air. There's a lot of appliances they have to do when people truly stop breathing, but you're going to feel unrested. So what happens is your oxygen saturation drops enough, your tongue falls back and you, your body will wake itself up from stage four which is your REM and restful and restorative sleep stage three. So your eyes are closed. You're still relaxed. You might just roll over onto your side, but you're not getting restorative sleep. Mm. So even if you slept 10 hours, you're not even getting three or four hours worth of quality sleep. So you end up with a sleep deficit, which then manifests in depression, anxiety, headaches, um, brain fog, all of these other spectrum of things that are related to how you're sleeping at night. Right. But you don't have this very clear sort of objective marker of just the number of hours in bed to cue you to the fact that you are sleep deprived. So like, in other words, people can be sleeping eight hours in bed, which is sort of the, the classic typical recommendations yeah. and think, you know, I'm spending adequate time in bed. Why am I still waking up? tired and, and fatigued and feeling unrested. Right. And so they'll say like, what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I suck at work. Like I had this presentation I couldn't even get it together. Like I, I'm barely making my way through the day or again, it becomes dangerous where they're falling asleep at stoplights or, you know, if, if they're a college student in class who's misdiagnosed, they're falling asleep in the back of the classroom. And it's actually just that they're at a sleep deficit. So people compensate with, coffee or trying to exercise or develop a better routine and they don't understand why they're getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. And um, that's where they'll turn to you. Something like I, I want to look into this. Is it uh, adrenal fatigue? Is it my thyroid's off? But no one's really looking at what about my airway, including your medical doctor or your dentist. Right. So um, I like the analogy of, the five blind men looking at an elephant, mm -hmm. right? So one's touching the ears and he's like, elephants are really soft and flexible. <laughs> and then another one's holding the tail and they're like, no, they're not. They have really coarse hair and they feel like a paintbrush. And one's holding the leg and they're like, no, they're broad and pebbled in texture. They're all describing different parts of the elephant, mm -hmm. but they're, they're not able to see the whole elephant, right? right? And so that's kind of where people get, get lost. Yeah. And, and, and I'll just add to that, you know, I've done a lot of work around sort of debunking adrenal fatigue and understanding the real causes of why somebody has low morning cortisol levels. And, you know, just as you're describing the, the elephant analogy, one of the things that is actually a real cause of low morning cortisol levels is, uh, is circadian rhythm disruption and sleep disruption. Yeah. So just to add to what you're saying, what is a very, very common and, and possible scenario is somebody who is showing up with low morning cortisol levels. If they go see somebody who's a proponent of adrenal fatigue, they'll say, oh, chronic stress is wearing out your adrenal glands. Let's get you on my adrenal support supplements and, and fix your adrenals. Um, but if the real problem is just sleep, 
disruption as a mm -hmm. result of an airway problem and a breathing problem, it, you can take all the adrenal supplements you want, but it's not going to fix the real underlying cause of that sleep disruption. That, that's exactly it. And, and it's, it goes even further than that with um, the inability to lose weight and how your body is processing these things. Simple, simple things can even worsen these conditions like being pregnant, having that, the shift of the weight of the baby developing or even just the pregnancy weight, a simple weight gain of even three to five pounds or getting a bad cold and having an inflammation in your throat can really exacerbate these things. And if they get bad enough, you actually never recover from that single onset trigger that sends you now into this, this horrible sleep deficit that develops over the course of a year. So there's not always, it's not always that you're just born with it. There are small changes, even again, you know, we, you start a desk job and you gain an extra 10 pounds that can shift the way we're sleeping, shift the pressure on our airway, and then lead us into these downward spirals of sleep deficit that then manifest as adrenal fatigue and, and whatnot. So um, what's so interesting to me too is now I've added to my health history exam, how well are you sleeping? Do you snore? Do you sleep on your back? Because what I'm finding is patients that are clenching and grinding their teeth, what happens is they're actually jutting their jaw forward at night to bring their tongue forward so it's not blocking their airway. So their body's trying to do their own CPR. Mm. We're seeing it in the mouth. But what are we taught in dental school? Right. Well, you grind your teeth because you're stressed. Right. So let me make you a mouth guard. There, you're cured. They're, that doesn't do anything for them other than keep their teeth apart, mm -hmm. but it's not addressing why are they grinding their teeth. Yeah. And so a lot of it is, again, because their arches are, are set too narrow and there's not enough room for, for their tongue at night. Yeah. So I have a question so, for you. Um, maybe some people are listening to this thinking, you know, is this just a really rare thing that, you know, maybe occurs in point? two percent of people but is is not at all a common thing what what in your experience how common do you think this is well what we're seeing now is they're saying that if people were truly diagnosed as not sleep apnea but sleep disorder breathing or obstructive sleep apnea and they're being treated for it correctly that they would need you need things like a sleep study to actually see how many events you are having per night where you're having these subtle wake-ups and how your oxygen saturation is dropping. It'll, if you truly have a number to correlate with it where people are being diagnosed, it's 60% of adults and, and possibly more than that of children. So, and we're talking young adults now. Like a lot of these cases are 24 year olds who just started law school. So again, we always are attributing it to the stress, but it might just be that they're studying more, they put on 10 pounds because they're always at the library and now that's affecting their airway, they're not getting restful sleep, and then it starts to go on from there. Yeah. And, and people don't often seek help until it's, it's truly a life-changing problem. Right. And so um, to go back to children, if it's diagnosed properly, um, there, there are countless stories of these mothers whose kids are um, a, having huge behavioral disorders, ADHD, they're flunking out of school, they can't read, they're being held back, they're always acting out. And a lot of times it's that their tonsils or adenoids are so large, they're blocking their throat and they have such crowded arches that they're not sleeping well and these kids have such an oxygen deficit they can't learn. And some of it actually is irreversible at a certain age. You know, I'll, I'll, sorry to interrupt, but I'll just mention that literally two days ago or three days ago, I saw a brand new study showing that um, ADD symptoms in kids are largely driven by circadian rhythm disruption. So, so I, I, you know, it's funny that I just came across research as you're, you're talking about this. Right. It's, it's, it's so fascinating. So I was, I'm not a pediatric dentist, but I was treating kids for a long time. So when I started looking in their, their throat, you'll see that, um, and most dentists don't, don't honestly look in their throat. We look for cavities. We look at the teeth. Mm -hmm. But now that I started looking there, I'm seeing not only kids where I'm asking mom, like, hey, um, are they able to, how do they sleep at night? Do they snore? Do they make, no oh, yeah, you should hear them at night. Mm -hmm. Kids should not snore. So that's a telltale sign. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't mouth breathe only. They'll have these very distinctive facial profiles that are going to cue you off as to 
how, they're, how well they're breathing, how much air they're getting. And again, air is gonna affect circadian rhythms, right? But it's not just that. If you question them further, a lot of these kids are picky eaters. They have a strong gag reflex. Those are again telltale signs the tongue can't get where it needs to. It doesn't have the peristalsis where it can swallow food. They can't even swallow a Sudafed if you were to give them a little pill. They gag on all their food. It makes them very, very picky. They're gonna trend towards softer carbohydrate foods. They're gonna be the kid who wants to eat goldfish crackers all day. And all that ties into the ADHD. Mm. And where do we see that in an adult? Adrenal fatigue, mitochondrial fatigue, lethargy, or just a non-productive member of society who's really obese and sits around all day watching TV. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's, let's talk about the link with obesity as well. Cause you know, there's a link between the quality of sleep or circadian rhythm and brain function, uh, as far as cognitive capacity, the ability to learn and focus and that sort of thing, as well as energy levels, obviously sleep and energy are really mm -hmm. two sides of the same coin. Um, but, also, there's a link with fat gain. You, you mentioned just now yeah. obesity. So what's what's the link there? So it's it's several fold. Um, the obesity can cause again changes in our our GI or the extra weight of a lot of people will gain weight in their neck as well. Um, that can lead to pressure on our airway or the lack of sleep makes their body not metabolize things as well and they'll end up getting uh, their hormones imbalanced and some of the things that get thrown off are leptin and ghrelin the carbohydrate craving and how we process our satiety center which leads to actually the obesity getting worse mm -hmm. they're going to want to crave sugar and carbs to try and essentially wake their body up throughout the day so people will get fatter essentially and then their airway gets worse mm -hmm. the other interesting thing is when they're struggling to breathe um, again it doesn't mean you're gasping for air at all it just means you're not getting enough oxygen saturation to get a true good circadian rhythm what we're seeing is that creates a vacuum pressure as they're essentially trying to struggle to breathe that's bringing acid up from the stomach into the throat so what I'm seeing in the mouth is a ton I mean these teeth look like they're dissolved in acid wow. I'm sending them to the ENT for, to, to be tested for gastric reflux disease or GERD. And then they're like, nope, he said I don't have it. I don't have heartburn. He said I'm fine. Or yeah, I take Pepsi AC. That's what they told me to do. It's actually something different. That's called LPRD. So laryngopharyngeal reflux disease, mm. which is this suctioning of the acid up the throat at night. That the leads acid from, from the stomach. From the stomach, okay. Um, that is part of this struggle to breathe at night that's wow. leading to a lot of things that will manifest in the mouth. Right. And it's easy for that liquid to flow up if you're on your side, you're laying down horizontally, yes. you're on your side, you're on your back, you're on your stomach. Typically people with any of these sleep disorder breathing, even if they can sleep on their back or start out with sleep on their back, will roll over to their side or onto their stomach mm. because they need to try and get their tongue from subconsciously falling back and blocking their airway. So. Um, back to the, the obesity um, issue, is it can be a very layered effect. If you are the typical patient with a big pot belly, a big heavy neck, jowls, you're gonna expect to see some sort of airway disorder. Mm -hmm. But now we're seeing a lot in very thin people. Mm -hmm. You might just have a little paunch. And, and that's, that's less a matter of, of the excess body fat constricting the airways and more matter just the structural issues yes exactly okay exactly excellent so what let's say somebody suspects they're they're a snorer and you know they are in bed for eight or nine or ten hours and they wake up unrefreshed and feeling like they haven't slept much um, what and and so this is you know they're kind of connecting the dots and light bulbs are going off in their head right now what are practical steps for those people to actually um, figure out if this is an issue if you know constricted airways are uh, is an issue for them and What can be done about this? Well, there's a couple good books if the layperson wanted to read it more and they're like this is sounding like me um, Sleep interrupted by dr. Stephen Park who's an ENT who talks a lot about this or this other book gas by dr. Gelb 
um, it really dives into each subsection where you're going to find out which category you fall into. You're going to be like, whoa, that's me. So if you wanted to get informed first on your own, those are some great resources. Um, you could ask your dentist. Uh, some of the things you'd look for are typically a grinding of your teeth at night. Um, snoring is another one. Uh, Non-restful sleep. Uh, frequent headaches. A lot of migraines are triggered by, again, the oxygen deficit. Mm. Um, a, the typical weight gain or inability to lose weight, um, again, is related to this. Uh, ADHD symptoms or uh, lack of ability to focus mm -hmm. um, and depression. There, there's a, a long list of symptoms. Even if you Googled obstructive sleep disorder or OSD, you, you, you might find a lot of things that'll pop up that would be related to you. So that'd be a place to start because it's a conversation starter, which then the next step would be if you were to seek medical attention for it would be to see an ENT or to go to a sleep center and have them do a sleep study. So there's home sleep studies that'll manage, or I'm sorry, monitor um, what your quality of sleep is, how your circadian rhythms are. They'll, they'll do sometimes a several nights study. Um, and your oxygen saturation, and some of them that are more severe are hospital-based sleep studies where you spend a night hooked up to a bunch of equipment. But that information is very powerful about what's going on with you getting enough oxygen at night. Mm -hmm. um, if you went to your general dentist and asked them, most wouldn't know what to look for. Yeah, so you'd want to see someone. There's a lot of people now who are trained in uh, sleep disorders. Okay. And it's on a lot of dentist websites. So that might be something you look at as well because they would know how to interpret this information and what to look for. Yeah. So let's say somebody does have uh, an obstructed airway, you know, granted there are certain different subtypes and that sort of thing, but what are we looking at as far as solutions? Is it the CPAP machine, surgery? Are there any other non CPAP or non surgical solutions? Yeah. This? So they found, um, so the most extreme would be a CPAP, right? You have to have forced air at night. The problem with that is it's usually a 40% success due to compliance based on a mask not fitting right, or people will improve and then they'll stop wearing it because it's not comfortable. So it's, that's not a huge range of people that even when truly diagnosed that are compliant with it. Mm -hmm. If they're a candidate or they can't do the sleep CPAP machine, again, some people are like, nope, not wearing it. There are things we can do as dentists. There's one called a mat. It's called a mandibular advancement device. So we can actually, it's like two little mouth guards or night guards hooked together to shove your jaw slowly forward at night um, so that your tongue won't fall back as far. And some people can have a huge improvement with that just in terms of getting restful sleep. Mm -hmm. um, you could also do your own. There's, a, there's different apps now, like there's one called Snorlan, where it, you can buy the app, I think it's $9.95, and see how much it'll spike your whole night on how much you're snoring or when your sleep is disrupted. There, there's some simple ways to kind of see if you are falling in that category yourself. Mm, that's cool. Um, but uh, again, you could, you could do the mandibular massive device. The surgeries typically aren't effective. Mm. Um, very few people are falling into the category of success. And even if you were surgically treated, again, those rates are on like 40% success. So it's hard to go through an aggressive surgery and then feel Five percent better. I, I'll just real quick story. I met a guy recently who um, has had extremely severe sleep apnea for I think decades, and has just suffered from this from from terrible fatigue as a result of not really getting any restful sleep for for decades. And he had a surgery. I've never even I didn't even know something like this existed, but he had some kind of like restructuring of his jaw yeah. that required his mouth to be shut, I think it was, I want to say six months. Yeah, you his, can, his, Like his mouth was shut for six months and could not speak for six months, which is just mind boggling that somebody could go through that. And I think it only had like a 40% or 60% success rate. So even after you've gone through that for six months, yeah. you then could find out you're one of the 40, 50, 60% who it doesn't even work for. Yeah, so in terms of the narrow arches, essentially what he had was there's, there's a several different versions of surgeries to advance the jaw by breaking it, cutting it to pieces, yeah. screwing it further forward so there's yeah. more room for the tongue. And then you can also do that with the upper jaw. And then you're typically wired shut for about eight weeks. And wow. then you're probably in braces for two to three years. Brutal. So I know there's, there's, there's some, there's 
different appliances now in dentistry too. But again, the hardest issue is, is compliance expense and people don't want to wear big retainers and appliances. Where's one I'm actually almost willing to wear myself and it's a suction cup that goes on your forehead and a suction cup that goes on your chin that connects to a mouthpiece that tries to reactivate stem cells to, to recapture the growth that was stunted in me by shoving my teeth back. Oh, wow. It's called a DNA appliance. There's something called a Bebos appliance, ALF appliances. It's very few dentists that'll do those. But it's really exciting with what we can do in children mm -hmm. to make sure that we're trying to maximize their growth. Some kids need, are now needing like three or four expanders and early braces. And again, it's not to treat the crooked teeth. It's to widen the arches, get room for all the teeth, and get room for the tongue, and get room for the airway. Wow. So in adults, when we're not growing, um, we're more limited to just treating the, the symptoms and trying to improve things. Now, what you have said is extreme, having having your jaws broken. Another extreme surgery is they inject um, like a pure alcohol into your soft palate and it creates a chemical burn that lasts about two to three weeks. It's, well, I've heard it's one of the most painful procedures you can go through wow. to try and scarify the back of the throat so that the airway opens more so more air can get down your throat. Um, they are removing the adenoids sometimes, the tonsils in adults. Um, but those are again extremes. So one of the cool things that's gotten me even more onto this path is I have a new laser where we can, um, it actually was discovered for vaginal rejuvenation. So what they found is in the lady parts area, they would use this same type of laser. Um, no, I do not use my laser for that. I, but um, it and would. The fact that you brought that up makes me think that you actually do. Yes. No. No. I, yeah. Um, not my area of expertise. But essentially, there, it would induce enough heat to cause collagen formation that would tighten things up. Mm -hmm. So how they actually decided to try and use it in the mouth, and we can. It's it's pretty painless. It feels like drinking a cup of warm coffee at its worst. Mm -hmm. um, we can wand the back of the throat. Sometimes it takes about three treatments, 21 days apart, and it opens up the airway. Wow. On every case, I've done it on, we take before and after pictures, and I've done it on some long-term sleep apnea patients. They felt leaving that they could breathe better because what happens is, and over the 21 days, the collagen starts to constrict more. But you should see some of the before and after pictures of how much wider the airway is. Wow. Now, it's not 100% successful on every person, but on the right person, it, it can create a tremendous impact. And again, at least it's, it's painless. Yeah. So, um, but it does need maintenance. So you would need to have like a yearly touch up. So that, that's another, another option. Yeah. Um, and then if you want your, your ENT, um, they, can, they can address other things. Because sometimes it's not just a pharyngeal breathing disorder. It's a nasal breathing disorder. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you're an athlete who had your nose broken. And so you have a deviated septum on top of it. So it's going to take being able to breathe through your nose. Some people can't even breathe through their nose. Yeah. And so um, it's, it's really, really interesting. But the problem is, is again, most people don't know where to get the information, how to get better. And I can only imagine how debilitating it feels to feel like you can't do anything throughout the day. Like for me, I'm a go, go, go person. But Friday nights are my worst. I'll sit down with a glass of wine and I can't even drink it. I'm like, out cold because I'm usually up to like one in the morning and I get up at six and I'm going all day long. And I work 12 hour days and I'm fine. But on Fridays, I'm literally drunk tired. Like I can't wow. even talk. I'm not a good Friday night date. My husband's not happy about it, <laughs> but it'll catch up to me. Yeah. But if I felt that way all the time, I can't even imagine because I can't, I can't even have a conversation. I'm just done. Yeah. And so I think that's where people read to really a point of panic because especially if you're if this is going on early in life and you're 27 years old I mean you have the whole rest of your life to live mm -hmm. and a lot of people can't even have healthy relationships because they're just in bed all the time or they're they're kind of um, you know no fun Bobby because they're they can't do anything yeah very exciting so so that's where people are going to reach out to you so I think just having more of this information and knowing what to look into is it's really really fascinating it's going to help a lot of people if they get the right the right help. Yeah, for sure. I'm gonna actually take some of this information and, and create a survey from it to see how prevalent this is. And among my Energy Blueprint members, I'm just curious how many of them um, are struggling with, with some of these issues or are likely struggling with them. I know actually in the context of chronic fatigue syndrome, there's some research showing that 
sleep apnea and other sleep disorders, uh, sleep movement disorders, and, and uh, you know, a couple other ones, but especially sleep apnea is actually shockingly common. Something yes, like 50% of is. people with chronic fatigue syndrome. It is. So what happens too is the lack of oxygen, the oxygen deficit over time leads to a heightened sense of pain. Mm -hmm. So it also leads to a lot of people, not just with chronic fatigue, but they're misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. And it's an inflammation and inflammatory feeling in the joints. There's constantly something's hurting. They feel worn down, achy, old, like they're in an old person's body. And it actually, again, is, is sleep disorder breathing related. Yeah. So um, very, very high. It might even be higher than 50%. Yeah. And again, there, our, our Western medicine philosophy is, Give them meds. So you're going to be, even if you were diagnosed with fibromyalgia, you're going to be given an antidepressant form, mm -hmm. which by the way, there's some really interesting studies now on how Prozac in one generation is changing the neurotransmitter development of the, their, their children. Really? I wondered about that. I and seen they're seeing it. They're seeing some new cool studies even in, in fish where they have like obviously something, someone that will rapidly populate. So you can see a ton of, new generations in a short frame of time. We can get into that in another study, but that's the sad part also. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want to get into the endocannabinoid system and how CBD can help people also because those same receptors where people are being treated with Prozac could be airway related. It could be related to another autoimmune disorder. Again, they're, they're, they could be treated with something naturally that's going to help them get a lot better. We talked a bit about how hidden things in the airway can impact your overall health mm -hmm. and restfulness and energy levels. And there's also a lot of things in dentistry, the materials or the way the materials are handled that can cause energy fatigue and a slew of other symptoms that seem unrelated but are actually related to the mouth. Okay. Like hidden factors. Yeah. You've told me, um, apart from this recording, how you've had a couple people that have come into your office recently that have had some serious health problems. Yeah. Um, and they're tracing it, they're tracing the origin of these serious health issues back to some dental work that's been done. Uh, can you just describe the details of this and sort of what lessons can be drawn from it? Yeah. Um, I had a patient today I saw a couple weeks ago in Ju July, she went down to, supposedly actually a holistic dentist in Tijuana and paid them cash and immediately her health started to decline. So she went to several other consults before me and then decided to have me do her dentistry, but unraveling all of it, she had 20 crowns done and now she needs several root canals and we're deciding how to manage that. She's so sick, she can't use the bathroom. She literally cannot go to the bathroom. She has such bad leaky gut that her skin's broken out. She has no energy, she can't sleep. She's getting heart palpitations. Her liver isn't detoxing. And when your liver doesn't detox, it makes your emotions go all over the place. So um, she sounds a little crazy. And, and in, in that, I just mean she's so emotional about how rapidly she deteriorated from this dentistry she's wanting me to unravel how to fix it. So we ran a biocompatibility test, which shows which dental materials you're allergic to. And her list is very, very long about the materials you can't use. Now I have to replace her dentistry. She just spent thousands and thousands. Yes, at a cheaper price in Tijuana, but now we have to redo all of it and none of it's going to be paid for. And she just wants it out of her mouth as quickly as possible. So hopefully some of her symptoms will start to go away. Right. Um, obviously, it's going to affect and impact your lifestyle if you can't, can't even use the bathroom. Yeah. Um, so we're working on her case. We're actually starting it uh, next week after we did a series of tests for me to get blood work in and figure out exactly what the main sources were. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it does tie into her dentistry. Mm -hmm. So then I have to figure out how to sequence it. So one, I don't re-overwhelm her immune system. And two, I can start phasing it so she gets better little by little in addition to working with a natural path to help detox her. Yeah. Um, another case yesterday, uh, the patient came in and wanted me to take out an old root canal of hers. And we have a meridian chart that shows which organ systems can be affected by the tooth. And uh, she told me that after, after it was done, she started having symptom after symptom. And within three months, 
she couldn't work at all. And she hasn't been able to work in over a year. Very intelligent person. Um, so she's hoping that this will solve a lot of the onslaught of symptoms that started the day she got it. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't always happen, but I think the correlations are really profound in some people. Mm -hmm. um, and I have another patient too that after we finished the dental work, same thing, she came in in a walker. She was on a list of meds through her Western medicine MDs, at least 15 medications. Um, she was in so much joint pain and lethargy that she couldn't sleep anymore. They kept giving her a ton of steroids to help with her inflammation. Came into me, we started unraveling a lot of it, and again, working with a naturopath. Within one month, she couldn't even keep food down when she first saw me. Within one month, she was able to eat. Mm -hmm. Within one month, she was off her walker, came wow. in walking. And now, it, two months out, she's on half of her meds. She's going on hikes with her husband. She's cooking again. And so I can't wait to see how things unravel at month three or four, but she's starting to feel like herself again. Mm -hmm. But I, I can imagine how traumatic it is for someone to have some dental work and some other things done, and then all of a sudden end up bedridden. Yeah. You know? So. How, how common do you think that is? Is this something that is just a super rare incident, or do you think that this is occurring a lot? I think it's occurring a lot because as dentists, we're very ignorant. We're not taught any of these things in dental school. You know, I had a patient yesterday whose parents came in because he's having such a bad reaction to his braces um, that his gums are overgrowing all of the brackets. They're so swollen. Oh, wow. So I said, I bet your orthodontist told you to brush more. And he's like, yeah, every time we go in, that's all they say. I know he has nickel allergy. We tested him. He does have a nickel allergy. Braces are nickel titanium. Mm -hmm. So just having a simpler reaction, but this is in his mouth 24-7 right. for the past 18 months. Yikes. And so in his case, you could physically see the reaction, but for most people, it, it can be a lot more subtle. And then for people like me, who I never knew I had all these problems, I mean, outwardly I'm very healthy, I'm high functioning, I don't need that much coffee, and I get through the day, but I'm Hashimoto's disease, MTHFR, I was mercury toxic, I still have to be on a daily detox regimen and watch what I eat mm -hmm. or else I, I can be very triggered. And if I was unaware or I had a lot of dental work done, thankfully I've, I've been blessed with having almost no dental work, I would have been highly, highly reactive and not have known why. Right. So and I think that's I, pretty powerful. I would imagine there's, so there's an incident like this woman who went down to Mexico and had some work done and then sort of immediately had all these very serious health problems mm -hmm. and could immediately trace the origin to the dental work. Yeah. But I would imagine there's a lot of incidences of, you know, for example, just getting um, silver fillings. Mm -hmm. you know, super, super common with mercury fillings. Um, you don't necessarily get any serious health problems immediately after getting mercury fillings, especially if you're a kid. Yeah. But those things are releasing mercury into the system, very small amounts every day for years and then years later it can manifest in some kind of in some kind of symptoms and you have no way of tracing that to the mercury toxicity right or we can just measure their their mercury levels at that current state and see right. how reactive they are but nonetheless and, it was a cumulative effect over the years right? right and sometimes the symptoms are more subtle you start getting more headaches or you get gut dysbiosis from the mercury and then you're having a lot of gi issues and you're thinking, oh, if you go to your Western MD, you're just told you have irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. you know, which has like a list of over 200 symptoms underneath it that just means something's not working. Right. Usually it's diet and then you can't detox if you have all this mercury in your system. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's really interesting, yeah, to, to see how, how subtle it can be. And even on patients where I'm identifying it and it's not the chief concern, um, like when we were talking um, about airway and I'm seeing all this acid erosion in their teeth, this heavy wear, a lot of dental work that's showing me that they're just fighting to breathe and their teeth are just jamming into each other at night. And then they have these other health symptoms. None of it's tying into them with, in their mind with dentistry. They're just at my office for cleaning. They have no concerns or they'll have some jaw soreness or something that develops. And then they want to treat the symptom. And it's kind of profound for some people to be like, well, it's not just this one thing. Here's, here's the a full issue right so um so yeah I, I enjoy unraveling some of those and some of them can be really complex yeah and I feel bad for people knowing what I know now 
who are seeking answers and they're feeling debilitated and they're they're trying their best to find the right practitioner and that they're kind of led astray especially if it's a traditional based doctor and their methodology mm -hmm. where they want to just give a pill or medicate something when the the easiest source and remedy might be just to cut out dairy or gluten and then avoid certain materials being used in the mouth and mm -hmm. you know um yeah yeah interesting um going back to the airway stuff i know that uh you have there's there's one other thing that we didn't really talk about which is the, the airway resistance yeah I, I just i realized when we were speaking earlier that i had forgotten to talk about another subcategory so instead of just sleep apnea there's obstructive sleep apnea osa or osd obstructive sleep disorder and there's also uars which is upper airway resistance syndrome that's one we more commonly see in thin females where um they're not necessarily truly snoring although lately i've had a lot of women who they're like, well, my husband says I snore. I don't think I do, you mm -hmm. know? But it's not always correlated with snoring, but they are very lethargic, high strung, never feel rested, um, bitchy, <laughs> resting bitch face. I mean, it, it's, it, you can laugh at it, but it's just kind of funny how you can almost see it walk in sometimes and then you'll start doing a questionnaire and I can tell that they are, are falling into that category, especially when I look into their airway. Yeah. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is you can get- Do you, do you tell them? I've discovered the source of your resting bitch face. Yes, exactly. And you know what? I might have a cure for that. <laughs> um, well, so you can also have your airway evaluated um, with a 3D cone beam. It's really interesting to see your profile mm. with essentially your skull with your skin off. And some people, their airway is so profoundly narrowed at night. It's like drinking through a, a, a breathing through a drinking straw versus a huge snorkel tube. And so, mm. You can use the 3D cone beam technology to have that evaluated if you really wanted to start undergoing treatment because we can do some dental treatments to expand the jaws and open the airway and then we can see a before and after result mm -hmm. on how much air they're getting besides just how well they feel. And then the other thing I didn't mention is um, instead of just going to a hospital for a sleep study, you can order a home test. So I can provide you with some of that information also of just how what you do is you contact this company I think it's about three hundred dollars and honestly going through your medical insurance a lot of your deductibles would probably be even more than that so even though it's cash it's it's uh, good value mm -hmm. they'll mail you a home sleep kit so it's something that I'll strap onto your nose and then a pulse oximeter that can go on your finger or there's some other monitoring devices but they're smaller and they're comfortable so it's going to measure your number of hypoxic episodes per hour and then per night and how well you sleep and your circadian rhythms and your oxygen saturation of your blood. And then you'll actually have like a Skype consult with um, a sleep specialist, a, a doctor um, who will give you the results. And then you can use those results to go to a dentist or, a, um, a, well, there are some sleep treatment centers who specialize in just the dentistry component of sleep disorders um, with those test results. Because typically, medical will cover a sleep appliance except the conundrum is ENTs who have to diagnose it or primary care but usually it's like the ENT realm they can't make sleep appliances only a dentist can mm. and we can't prescribe them without having oh, and then, but you're, you're, yeah so your medical insurance will kick in you just need to have this this overlap yeah. so this will help with that overlap you can literally walk in and say here's my sleep study can you make me an appliance? Which appliance would be best for me? Mm -hmm. So, and That's then there's awesome. other side benefits besides feeling rested. Again, you'll you can you'll start losing weight when your body starts your metabolism and your circadian rhythms start falling in line. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things will start to improve. Mm -hmm. Besides the fact that your partner can now sleep in the same room. Yeah. So, awesome. so I wanted to mention those things because I don't want people then feeling overwhelmed. Where, well, go get a sleep study. Okay, great. How do I do that? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the big barrier, yeah. right? Is like, you know, even for people who are snorers or people who have some of these symptoms, it's like, well, I don't want to have to go through a whole sleep study. And it's such a pain in the ass to do that. It is. I mean, for goodness sakes. I mean, even if I felt unwell, I would immediately tough it out. Cause it's like, I don't have time to go to the doctor, let right. alone like schedule the console to get the sleep study order to schedule right. a date with the sleep center to go into the hospital, especially for these milder cases too, where they're not truly apneic. 
um, where it's a UARS or OSB or OSA, it's really going to be impactful for them just to have a simple appliance made at the dentist. Mm -hmm. But again, they would need to undergo the sleep study to to have it properly diagnosed and covered by okay. their medical. And what? How can people get that? Just just to to recap, how can people get that device? to the home device and to do sort of an at-home sleep So you study. really want to have a dentist. So the, to order the home sleep study, I'll provide you with the, the website information. Just okay. uh, You can provide a link so that people... Do you know the can, name of the company offhand? Um, you know, actually, I don't. I don't want to okay. say it wrong because there's, there's quite a few of them. Um, and then there, you're, you would want to go to a dentist who's trained in sleep. Okay. So, you know, I know a lot, of, a lot of my dental community, we all have it on our menu, our list of services. If you Google... Uh, sleep dentist, you're going to have quite a few of them who've done a lot of extra training where it pops up. Okay. So we'll put a link uh, on the page for this podcast, yeah. which will be at, at my site, theenergyblueprint.com. Um, there'll be a link to it. If you're watching this on YouTube, there'll be a link below the video. If you're listening to the audio, you'll have to go to theenergyblueprint.com and find this podcast, Dr. Nicole Vane, and we'll have it uh, set up on that page. Yeah. And the other thing that I would we could provide a link for is for for children i'm just really passionate about airway development and expansion in children so we can prevent this in adults as we talked about with the price plunger study the arches are all getting extremely narrow i mean even my own son in front of my own eyes who was breastfed but tongue-tied has very narrow arches so um you can get a dentist trained in what's called a vivo appliance v-i-v-o-s or a dna appliance both of those actually the dna appliance can treat adults it supposedly can activate stem cells to regrow the jaws into a wider position. Mm -hmm. um, and, but with kids, it's a lot easier, mm -hmm. especially because as adults, our compliance usually, even the most dedicated person doesn't want to talk funny or wear a big piece of plastic in their mouth during the day mm -hmm. if they have meetings or they're in a socially oriented. I mean, even I would feel a little self-conscious, but I am considering ordering one for myself. Um, just just to just to see if I can wear it all day long while while talking to patients all yeah. day. I, I wonder that I was thinking about this the other day. Um, you know, with retainers and stuff, do some of these materials that are plastic that are meant to sit in the mouth that maybe do good things as far as realigning the teeth, yeah. do they are they also releasing plastic toxins, phthalates or BPA and, and things like that into the mouth? And even some of the BP BPA free plastics still have other things like BPS or oh, antimony yeah. or, you know, some of these other toxic chemicals. Yeah. And I just read, uh, well, it wasn't a good clinical study. It would not pass the Dr. Ari Witten test, but <laughs> on how live floss is releasing now a bunch of toxic chemicals from the Teflon coating that it has I, on it. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that they actually, well, they actually, should, the study I saw, I don't know if it's the same one, but this, they showed that people who use the flossers that have those coatings mm -hmm. actually have higher body burden of those chemicals. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it's hard to correlate exactly that it's only that in right. those individuals. So, but um, no, you're absolutely right. Because I just had a patient yesterday who I love doing clear aligner therapy, like Invisalign for people that have metal sensitivities. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I've myself undergone treatment. I had a patient who not only could not wear those, I mean, she literally couldn't even wear it for a day or two because of her allergy. Then they made her a night guard and she couldn't wear that either. So we're gonna run the um, biocompatibility test on her just so I can find out um, the, the right material for her. Mm -hmm. So, cause there are some of the things in some of they're, they're, they're called bisacryls where they're either, even though they're not BPA, there's a resin cascade or an acrylic type cascade that some people are sensitive to. Gotcha. And also some of these appliances have metal springs in them. So even though they're not embedded in you, wearing them constantly, if you're very sensitive to metals, can be an issue in some people. That's pretty rare. I have people that are just insistent, absolutely. No, 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 I don't want anything. But then we're really limited on our options because we got to make them out of something. Sure. We don't use wood. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, George Washington days. It's, uh, <laughs> so, so, but there are ways to find biocompatible materials. Yeah. Interesting. You mentioned in passing a minute ago, the Pottinger's cats. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to that. I guess we kind of, we covered that a bit, but I want to talk some specifics as far as what, what have we learned from not only those studies, but, you know, all of the studies that have happened since as far as what are some of the key nutrients 
uh, and, and important facets of nutrition for optimizing dental health and also in our kids, uh, you know, the, the proper growth of the jaws and, and the arches and the way the teeth grow in? Um, that's, a, that's a great question because it actually boils down to a couple simple things that unfortunately just based on our society, the way we're processing and handling our food, even if you grew it in your backyard, the nutrients in the soil aren't there to get it into the vegetables anymore. Even if you had a hot house, I mean, it's really amazing how much it takes to get soil well-developed with chickens pooping on it and goats eating the weeds away and pooping and then birds coming in and eating that. I mean, it's, it's really profound. So besides what's lacking in our nutrients, um, the biggest thing they noticed was D3K2 was what price, he didn't know what to call it, and they discovered that's what it was. So vitamin D3K2 is he mostly in- like factor X or yes, something. Yes, he right? did, he absolutely did. And then they, he was later identified as K2. Mm -hmm. So that's found in a lot of organ meats. So what we've done is not only transition away from the agrarian lifestyle of you know the women planting the vegetables and harvesting them, and the man goes out and kills something with an arrow, and everyone barely cooks it over the fire, and we eat it off the bone and we chew, um, to this processed, you know, wheat, chicken McNugget, mac and cheese lifestyle. So it's partially just the chewing off the bone, but we're also getting very collagen dense foods. So that's where, you know, bone broths and things are coming back into play. Um, and then D3K2 is in a lot of the organ meat, especially so in, depending on the culture, like in Eskimo tribes, it might be in the seal blubber. Um, where you'd get enough, um, where we got our milk sources. Like, again, in an Eskimo tribe, it might be reindeer milk. Um, but a lot of those are very, very raw milks where they're really nutrient-dense and high in D3K2. So especially when we were milking the cow in our backyard and our cow was grass-fed, not grain-fed, we were getting a lot of these nutrients just naturally in the, the simple basic diets that we had. Um, so nowadays, you know, getting out in the sun also is something we're not doing. We're all just sitting in front of computer screens, iPads. So our D3 is deficient that we're not out enough in the sun doing normal, natural things. We're not hoeing our fields or doing anything, but also we're not getting it from our food sources. But it's really important because it's a fat-soluble vitamin that we take it the right way. Um, also the A, E, and K. Not just the K2, but the, the K vitamins. Those all help with the way your blood clots, the way we heal. If you bruise easily, you're probably deficient in the K. And a lot of the B vitamins, too, are very, very poorly absorbed. Mm -hmm. So um, the combination of all of those is making our jaws weak. What we're taught in dental school and then what medicine's also taught is now they're giving kids fluoride tablets at the pediatrician's office. Fluoride tablets. Tablets. To take internally. Yes. Whoa to ingest because they're like, well, we're going to prevent cavities. Well, no, actually the kid has leaky gut because the mom's nutrient deficient also, yeah. and they're not breastfeeding, and they can't breastfeed because they have a tongue tie that's undiagnosed. I mean, it's, it's incredibly sad and complicated, but they're, they're now giving kids that. I, and we're I just, saw, it's always like, oh, you're not getting enough calcium. Right. I just real quick, you just reminded me of a quote I saw the other day from Dr. Williams something who works for the EPA. And he said, in commenting on fluoride, he said, you know, fluoride is this fascinating thing because when you have fluoride in a natural body of water, you have it in a lake or a river or something like that, um, it, is, it is a contaminant and a toxin. It is yes. labeled as a contaminant and toxin. Um, as soon as you put it in the drinking water for humans, it's no longer a contaminant and toxin. As soon as you prescribe it for kids to take, you know, orally, it's no longer a contaminant and toxin. It's a medicine, right? And it, the, the thinking on this issue has become very distorted because there, there is a lot of research showing that fluoride is, does have neurotoxic properties. Um, and even if it does support proper dental health, you have to weigh that well, okay. and also thyroid suppressive. Before right. we had our modern-day thyroid meds, they were given excessive fluoride to suppress their, their thyroid. Right. It's, it's, it's toxic to the thyroid, it's toxic to mitochondria, and it's toxic to the brain. And there's research yeah. showing all of those right. things, and yet it's just totally ignored you know, as, as they're, they're literally putting it in the drinking water. I know. The and the, and the, the funny, and you should be in some of my dental forums because everyone's like, yay for the ADA for keeping fluoride. Like, you know, I, I, my town, fluoride cavities decreased just because of fluoride. And I've been practicing 30 years. But on the flip side, too, mercury. So I have to 
regulate and log how I dispose of it. I have to have special traps. I can't like dump it in the sink. I can't dump Correct. it in the trash. Yet I can throw it in your mouth. You can throw it in your mouth where and, it actually and, is yeah, shown to get absorbed exactly. and sometimes off gas. And I could, if I break a thermometer in the old school days, I would have to, we'd have to evacuate because of the release mercury. Right. If I poured a broken thermometer into the water, the EPA would call it absolutely toxic. But based on its parts per million, and again, I can put it in your mouth. Yeah. And the CDA is like, ah, it's safe to use, but you do have to, by law, have a posted sign that it's neuro, a known neurotoxin and can affect, affect developing embryos and to right. make the decision essentially for yourself. Yeah. It's it's all very strange yes. medicine to me. Yeah. Um, thankfully, I don't go to the doctor much. <laughs> <laughs> just because I just, it, you know, it's, it's just the way we've gotten with just over-medicating people. And that's a problem with our diet is that when people aren't functioning well, I know you see this, this is why I love talking to you about it. They crave things like the carbs and more processed food. They're often always carb addicts. They're craving like a bowl of noodles and white rice and you know, they, there's no nutrients in there. So they're, they're further exacerbating the symptom when they're like, oh, but that's what settles my stomach or gives me a little energy boost to get through the day. Mm -hmm. Um, instead of really reorienting the way their body's processing and thriving on foods. It's pretty amazing. Like even if you did fasting, you can go without food and your body can perform really well once you get a lot of the junk processed out. Yeah. So, so with, with that in mind, what do you think the optimal diet looks like for dental health? So we, we kind of, you mentioned vitamin D and K deficiencies, yes. um, uh, also some mineral deficiencies. What, what does it look like on sort of on a practical level if someone wants to structure their diet for optimal dental health? Uh, more of an alkaline-based food diet. So if you're juicing, not having all carrot and apples with, that can cause a, acidity, essentially, in your mouth. There's a lot of high sugars in some of those fruits. So I would not advise being fruitarian, um, but mixing it in. Um, so more alkaline-based foods, great fats like avocados, um, having to get organ meats like if you have to order it i go to the farmer's market and get fresh chickens fresh eggs it's really amazing that they can sit out for three weeks because they have the bloom on the shell so then they're, they're not pasteurized and processed um raw milks i mean i that's personally the only milks i can tolerate besides goat's milk or sheep's milk um if it's going to be from a cow having good good sources of vegetables so i i do organic i do i can't get to the farmer's market i do home delivery of my vegetables just to make sure and you want a little bit of dirt on them you want to make sure it's from a good source so that you're getting good microbes from the soil to keep our gut developed so those are some important things obviously avoiding antibiotics i mean we're in the season right now with winter where people are just being giving them left and right you know um those are really good places to start an alkaline water, and then also evaluating what you're drinking during the day. Like I had a patient who read something about apple cider vinegar. So she was drinking it all day long. Mm -hmm. And she ended up with a lot of cavities because it was just too acidic and right. kombucha. So they're great things, but everything in balance and moderation. Yeah. So those are places to start. And then also like I just try and keep as much as I can away from heavily processed foods. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do it too. I go to Trader Joe's. I have a two-year-old. I'm a working mom. I work long hours. Um, but it's just how I mix it in and what I look for. And if I am going to grab something off the shelf um, so that I can try and get as, as many of the nutrients as possible. Really making your bone broths is so easy at home. It can be expensive if you're looking to buy them pre-made. Like at, at Whole Foods, they're like, eight bucks a, a jar. Mm -hmm. So if that was a simple snack for you, that could be a lot for a lot of people, but, and nut butters are, are great fats. Um, I, you probably have more advice than me on, on some of the things. Yeah, I'm not on, on dental health specifically. Yeah. That's, that's your territory. I, yeah. I'm definitely not an expert specifically on diet and dental health. But really what, what makes a gut thrive is what's going to make a mouth thrive. So if you read of any of the anti-foods, um, and, and subtleties too, like some people are, if you're really going to go aggro on the veggie thing, if you're sensitive to nightshades, it's going to make you really acidic, um, which would make your saliva more acidic, which can really affect your teeth and your overall oral health. So really understanding your own chemistry too of what foods work best with you. Yeah. As you know, there's some tests you can do, but some of it's just trial and error. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I know one other topic that we had talked about going into before we started recording was the endocannabinoid system and CBD. And you've been experimenting with that and, and you've been having some great results in, in oh, your yeah. patients. So talk to me about what you've learned and what you've been experimenting with. Well, so I became fascinated with it just in the more natural approach. Um, but then I'm also like the last person you would suspect of, of being interested because I thought it was made from marijuana and I'm like, I'm hippy dippy in my soul, but I'm also not in the regard. I've never tried anything. Yeah. Glass of red wine is about as crazy as I get. So I was really like, well, let me look into this. So CBD, the cannabinoid system was made from hemp. So you'd have to have enough hemp the length of a football field to have even trace amounts of THC. It doesn't have any in it. But what's interesting is there's several cannabinoid receptors within our neurotransmitter system, um, specifically our parasympathetic system. So our rest and digest. So fight or flight is our sympathetic system. Parasympathetic is how we're gonna process things and get our body to calm and heal. Mm -hmm. So the cannabinoids bind to all of those. They bind to the same receptors as pain receptors. They bind to the same receptors as Xanax and Prozac. So if you had apnea and that made you highly anxious, if, you, if you're just anxious in general, if you have gut dysbiosis and you're having all these other inflammatory things that are developing because your body's just inflamed in general, it helps with all of those things. If you have constant migraines and headaches, oh my gosh, it is amazing within five minutes. Um, because it not only binds to those same receptors, but with people who, again, don't know enough about their diet, like gluten and grain can cause a lot of migraine triggers in people. Um, they typically then start medicating with things like Excedrin or Imitrex. There's a lot of over-the-counter drugs, whereas CBD works just as effectively. So um, I had my, my own hygienist. Now, I mean, she's one of my biggest raving fans about it. Uh, she came up to me and said, um, Dr. Bean, I'm going to have to cancel my patients. I, I'm about to get a migraine, and when I do, I have to lay down or I'm going to start throwing up. And I said, actually, can you please just take some CBD? I don't want to cancel your day. And she was so skeptical. She's like, I know myself. I said, well, please just trust me. So she did, and she took it, and then she took another dose at lunch. And at the end of the day, she's like, I have to buy this. I just can't believe I've never – and every time now she gets a trigger – she just has it with her and she's, she has not had one migraine since wow. she discovered it. And I obviously have a lot of patients that say the same things. Yeah. Um, there, there's some research. I don't know if you've seen it from uh, a guy named Ethan Russo on clinical endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome, linking it with migraines, fibromyalgia, chronic yes. fatigue syndrome. For inflammatory disorders. And also when you mentioned the deficiencies of the endocannabinoid system, when I talked briefly about like soil deficiencies earlier, that's where we've gone off track. Like our body always got a little bit of, we were using hemp for a long time for making clothes and other products. It's, it's been in our society for a long time. It's just hasn't been appreciated for this use. Um, but not only with the migraines, but inflammatory disorders where people are in a lot of pain or I have patients who are on chronic steroids, it, it, it really works. Now, some of them, some of the pain disorders, I know I've now networked with some, um, clinicians who are in a hemp dentistry and medicine group that I'm in and they're using it for all sorts of pain disorders where people are on lifetime steroids, which again will cause other inflammatory disorders in your body who are getting them off of them. But some of them need a little bit of THC in it. Yeah. So start first with the CBD. Um, for me, I use it if I'm getting um, splitting headaches, uh, jaw pain, any back pain, it, it binds to those. Um, people with anxiety though, when they come to the dentist, it works better than nitrous or some of my sedative pills. Mm. I have friends that are super stressed and they're like, I have presentations at work. I'm just, I'm just going crazy right now. And can I take it for my presentation? And every single one I've given up to has come in to get refill bottles because it's obviously working for them. One of my friends said she would be jobless and not married if I hadn't introduced her to it. She wow. also, I gave her one dose just in the dental chair. She doesn't dig the dentist. And she's very enthusiastic. She's like, oh my God, you changed my life. And I'm like, ha ha, you know, that's so sweet. But truly, she came back to me and she told me that she's been on Prozac for 15 years. And just the dose I gave her in the dental office, she called her um, psychiatrist on the way home and said, I need to get off Prozac because 
I feel nothing with that. And the way I felt on CBD is the way I should feel. Like I feel imbalanced. I feel happy. I feel not stressed. I don't feel obviously clouded in judgment. It doesn't impair you in any way. So, and now that's all she takes. Wow. So it's, it's really interesting, especially when you read, it's so commonly medicated now, especially Xanax. I have friends asking me all the time, can you give me some Xanax? I'm stressed. That I don't know if you saw some of the studies recently where they're finding in fish that the giving Prozac to them, it immediately affects their offspring genetically, their genetic expressions. Mm -hmm. So even if you're taking it for something simple like behavior or you're feeling not yourself or whatever, it actually can impact your kids and your kids' kids. Well, wow. so it's much safer to take something like CBD. Mm -hmm. The only cautions are there's just a bunch of crap out there. Yeah. You know, for all the powdered drinks, you know, all the keto drinks that are just going to supercharge you by having this raspberry flavored powder. It's like they're, they're not nutrient dense. Same thing with CBD. It can be just very, very poorly absorbed. Mm -hmm. And you also want to make sure it's organic because hemp draws everything from the soil. It super saturates it. So if someone was growing hemp at home and Roundup's running down the hill into their yard, your hemp is going to be a super saturated bomb of Roundup. Mm -hmm. And they might even call it organic because they grew it in their backyard. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of important to know where you're getting it from and you want to make sure you have a water soluble form. Mm -hmm. So I like the Prime My Body brand and I like Ultra Cell by Zillis because they're both THC free. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I worry, I, I mean, I'm my own, I'm self-employed. But I still don't want to, I don't know why. You want to make sure you pass your yeah, own Yeah, my drug. own drug test, your own damn drug it. Test so you don't have to so, fire yourself. Yeah, so anyone who's concerned like that, it, it doesn't show up. But also I know it's highly absorbed. Yeah. And I could tell because I have some people drop off samples. And they're like, hey, it's my CBD in the waiting room. And I wanted you to try mine. And it's like awful. Everybody's got their own CBD brand. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. <laughs> and then I've had some patients that are like, yeah, it does have work. And I'm like, oh, well, where were you getting it? Well, I have a CBD tea or I had a, one of my yogurts has CBD in it. And it's like, oh my goodness. It's like, yeah, the, the dose is also something that yeah. people don't really know how to consider deeply. So yeah. like sometimes you'll see a product at like, for example, there's here in town, there's a CBD water. Um, <laughs> like it's water with CBD infused into it. Now I, I don't know for certain, for certain, but I would guess that probably in that whole bottle, it's like, five milligrams of cbd right which is or maybe 10 let's right say. And but it's just you're gonna pay for an expensive bottle of water that doesn't have a meaningful dose yeah of cbd because it would be otherwise and it has to be that way you know from their perspective if they put in 30 yeah. milligrams of cbd into each bottle of water they'd have to charge you 10 10 dollars per bottle of water you know i'm just laughing because i what i immediately popped in my head was and cinnamon toast crunch is vitamin fortified. Right. And like it's like one percent of like a, some of the daily nutrients, but they put that on the outside of the box, yeah. so people are like, "I'm having something healthy," and you're right. like, "Cinnamon toast crunch? Yeah, it says it has vitamins in it." And you're like, "Oh my goodness." Yeah. Same thing with that. Even if it was chocked with vitamins, you wouldn't absorb it through your cinnamon toast crunch. Sure. So or absorb it well. Yeah, and and actually that goes back to when you're asking about the the supplements or what we're dietary deficient in, vitamin C obviously, and vitamin A and E are important for our body's detox. But C, for instance, if you're like, well, I don't wanna get sick, I'm gonna super regulate my immune system and I'm gonna drink that emergency powder all day long, I'm gonna have 10,000 milligrams a day, where you're gonna urinate all of it out. If you have a liposomal form that you go in sublingually with, you're gonna actually absorb all the milligrams that you're trying to get into your system. Same thing with the D. So you want to make sure you're getting a good source um, so that your body is getting what it needs. Mm -hmm. And again, everyone, it's dose dependent on, on some individuals are more deficient than others. Mm -hmm. so, um, so those are important things to look for. Yeah. Do you have uh, any sort of closing thoughts? I, you know, one other thing I want to mention is before we started recording, you mentioned that sometimes cases will present as fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome and you know something deeper is going on and Again. it may actually be dental related do you do you want to i know we kind of touched on that a bit with for example the person who went down to, to mexico for their dental work but do you have any thoughts on that because i think it's important for people to just understand that 
dental work is not something to mess around with and look for discounts. You really want to find somebody who has real expertise if they're doing any serious work in the mouth. Right, right. And it's the same with, gosh, I love the show Botched on bad plastic surgeries, but a lot of them happen in Mexico or someone has someone come in their home and this girl was having someone inject silicone into her her butt so she would have a beautiful Brazilian butt. Yeah, I do that every other yeah, day. I, I mean, somebody come over here. That's why I have such a beautiful butt. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And your pec implants too, right? Yeah. Your, no, it's so, so she went into rapid kidney failure. She was in Oof. intensive care for over two weeks and years later she still hasn't fully recovered. She has very poor kidney function from this silicone and then they couldn't even get it out of her system. Mm. And I'm using that as an example of someone would be like, well, mm. duh. Why would you go let someone come to your house and inject silicone in you that's not even medical grade? But people don't realize that's going on the same way with even a well-intentioned dentist. So that's that's an important factor. But when, fibromyalgia, when we were talking about that, it's people are truly suffering from those symptoms and would be classified as such. And unfortunately, if they went to the medical doctor, and I say that in quotes because they just a lot of times get antidepressants yeah. and something of that nature. Or sleeping pills. Yep. Or told and they're given sleeping pills, but yeah. that's when I mentioned earlier yeah. how it's tied back to sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Most often, they're just not getting enough oxygen. Yeah. So their body goes into inflammatory distress and everything becomes painful. Yeah. So not only are they lethargic, I mean, if you think about it, like, they torture, like actually in the Navy SEALs, part of you passing through buds is they go through, um, they try and break you with depriving you of sleep. So some people literally go insane and they have to be discharged from yeah. buds. And I'm told actually some don't even really recover based on how they, <laughs> they react to the sleep deprivation. Right. So imagine that's an extreme case, right? But that's how they torture people in Guantanamo. Yeah. They keep that's you up they, 96 hours. The, the worst the worst one though is that's how they that's sort of like a rite of passage in medical residencies. Yeah. Is they'd have, you know, these these newly graduated doctors going through the residency and it, I think this used to be more the case than it is now. Yeah, they, now they, they've realized yeah. the stupidity of it, but they used to have these people working 100 hour weeks or 120 hour weeks just Maybe not 120, but something like. No, eight, actually, eight. no. You're you're am, right. Am I yeah, right about that? yeah. Sleep um, a couple so hours like, in a break room in between a patient. Yeah, like, close your eyes and. Yeah, like 80, 90, 100 yeah. hour week stuff stuff in there, and there's actually the the worst part is that they they have research now showing the amount of medical errors and people harmed by doctors who are making mistakes as a result of their brain not functioning well, yeah. as a result of being overworked and sleep deprived. It's true with pilots too. Yeah. They limit their flight hours now because some people were put on back to back to back flights mm. and it was just, you know, planes weren't falling out of the sky, but there were more problems than I think we realized. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so a lot of people get so shut down and then, you know, what do we do? We self-medicate mm -hmm. coffee, carbs, mm -hmm. trying to go for a run in the morning to wake yourself up, you know? And so it's important to, just to ask yourself. And so one of the things we talked about putting on your site also was just a, a sleep questionnaire. Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple questions, but if you score high on it, it's, you're like, Oh my God, how did I not? I just, cause it, to, you know what, to everyone, that's their normal. It is not normal to go poop once a week mm -hmm. and have a big hard turd that doesn't barely comes out. Mm -hmm. But people are like, yeah, it is. I'm that way. My mom's that way. My sister's that way. And it's like, well, you all have the same genetics. You all eat the same things. Mm -hmm. So it's, no, that's, that's you not just went a little Southern on me there. I know, y'all. <laughs> um, but I, I, a lot of people just think this is this is just how it, how I am right now. And it's mm -hmm. only when people reach a critical point where they start seeking out information like that you provide, where they're like, "This is not how I am. This is not how I've been, and I need to get out of this quote funk." Right. So yes, it can relate a lot to inflammatory disorders. Mm -hmm. And again, none of my patients who I'm treating came in with mouth pain. Yeah. It's all systemic stuff. Right. So you can only imagine too, um, if they had been seeing the MD on the side, a lot of them are going to be given a lot of medications that compound or mask, or then if, it, if it's suppressed for a little while, it doesn't mean that it stopped. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the, the so, problem that we have in the medical world today is that everyone's specialists, their particular little yeah. slice of the overall system of a human being. And there's, you know, it's, everybody has their sort of way of looking at that part of the body yeah. or that system. 
and trying to fix that system with their limited set of knowledge and tools yeah. about that system. And there's, there's so much problems with people, majority of these specialists just lacking an understanding, a deep understanding of how interconnected all of the different systems of the body are. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's for that reason, I think extremely important for people given, you know, the nature of dental work and how easily something like heavy metals in your mouth or the wrong kind of materials in your mouth can translate into really serious systemic problems, brain problems, gut problems, yeah. skin problems. Um, I think it's just imperative to work with a holistic dentist who really understands those things deeply. Yeah. And also getting it through to the patient, like this patient, I could not reinforce enough how much I have to work with a naturopath, but just cause I get the dentistry out, I'm not getting it out of your brain now, out of your gut. You right. have to start extracting it through there. There are a lot of different detoxes people can do, but, and sometimes it's a dietary detox too. When I did a cleanse, I mean, you're just trying to get all the crap and the, things that are built up on the inside of your intestine that you can't see out and you start to feel a lot better. Again, it manifests in your skin, your hair, your overall functioning. So, um, I really value what you do. I'm, I'm glad you had me on just so I could talk about our little piece of the world. Yeah. How I see it. Yeah. I'm really glad so. you came on. Thank you for, for being on the show again. I know the, the first podcast was a hit. People really loved it. So, um, I'm excited to share another one and, um, also keep doing good work on my mouth. Oh, <laughs> That's my personal insight. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, on a, on a serious note, I would love to, I think we did this in the first one as well, but just to reemphasize this, um, are there any resources for people to sort of um, like find a list of dental practitioners in their area that are sort of, have some particular yeah. certification that you know, mm -hmm. speaks to their knowledge and expertise of holistic dentistry? It's kind of hit or miss. Um, the one easier resource is the IAOMT, the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. Um, and you want someone who's like smart certified, which is safe mercury amalgam removal technique. Because some people say they are, and then they're a member, but they don't attend any of the meetings mm. and they're not actually certified. Um, Hal Huggins certification. Now I'm certified, but they want you to pay $2,500 a year to be listed on their website. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a little, I don't know. I, I think so you, it's, just like but you, they could inquire. They could inquire, or ask dentist, the dentist. Yeah. Cause I don't, office, yeah. Are you Hal Huggins certified? Yes. Or okay. smart certified. Okay. Um, there's the holistic dental association, the HGA. But again, you, you can tell a little bit through people's websites too. Yeah. Because there's quite a few here in San Diego that I know aren't holistic or trained. I've never they seen just, them in a meeting. They, they just, just use the word to, to market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To like yeah. attract people who are. Or I think they that. just have their own version. Mm. They're not, but it's not, it's like, it's not supported by our academies. Right. So you, you know, if you want to have some sort of standard of care, that would be a great way to go. Okay. I mean, if you're willing to fly to Switzerland too, there's some great experts out there too. That it's actually cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, who use really biocompatible materials, they're, they're experts. Um, so just doing a little bit of research on that, not just, I say I'm the best and look at my fancy website and I'm the number one expert and just, it, it'll, it'll show itself based on their degrees and their training mm -hmm. and how involved they are. You know, I know a lot of older holistic dentists I tried to learn from that call themselves holistic just because they didn't place mercury yeah. and they cared about how they drilled them out, but they weren't doing it to the standard that we, we uphold now. Gotcha. So, um, for people that are in, we're in San, we're in San Diego, uh, North County, San Diego, for people that are in San Diego or people in Southern California, um, or nearby who maybe are interested in coming to see you or, you, you know, even, I know there are some people that have flown across the country to see you, um, where what's your contact info and what's your website that oh, you can um, send people to? My personal email is Dr. Nicole Vane at Yahoo. And sometimes I had people from the last podcast contact me from Germany or can you tell me where. And I'm involved in quite a few forums where sometimes I really I, I actually could know someone right in your area in your town. I mean I know a ton of people in small town Texas even that do great work. Okay. Are you um, sure you want to be bombarded with yeah. emails asking well, for recommendations for have, their local town? Yeah. Well, I can get to them as I as I can. Um, but there are some some great resources that I, I I might be able to refer them to someone amazing. Okay. Um, I will say just for everybody listening, just be mindful of taking up too much yes. of her personal time asking for recommendations in your local area. Yeah. If you have serious medical 
you know, issues and, and dental issues. Do your and research you need, first. And, and you yeah. need help, you know, try and look, but, um, f- and feel free to reach out, but yeah. just, just, I, I just don't want her to be bombarded yeah. with 5,000 emails, you know, from people all asking for recommendations. And, um, really my website, I, I try to make it very educational for anyone logging on. It doesn't matter if you're, if you look at mine, I have a lot of videos on what is involved in safe mercury removal or proper safe extraction or cavitation. So if people just wanted to learn a little more, I have it on there just for strictly educational purposes. Great. So people can log on at any time. We might beach dental.com. Moonlight beach, beach dental. dental. All one word, right? Yeah. Moonlight beach dental.com. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Vane. Really such a pleasure to have you on and hang out as always. And, um, I, re- I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening. And just one more quick reminder before you go, right now until April 15th, just from April 4th through the 15th, we're releasing our Energy Blueprint Masterclass training. This training is packed with science-based strategies to help you overcome fatigue and dramatically increase your energy levels. Now, I'm not talking about gimmicks and quick fixes and magic pills and stimulant and sugar-based energy drinks and energy pills. I'm talking about the cutting-edge science to help you build real energy and vitality at the cellular level, the habits to build a high energy body. Now this is only available for the next few days for free from April 4th through the 15th. So go take action on this right now. Go to theenergyblueprint.com forward slash masterclass and you can get access right now. Theenergyblueprint.com forward slash masterclass. Hope to see you over there.